Welcome, and thank you for attending the first lecture Markets and Morality is hosting this school year. I'm Anna Kate Peterson, and I'm a junior member of Markets and Morality. Markets and Morality is, at its core, a student-led reading group dedicated to studying and engaging with enduring questions and ideas, especially as they apply to issues of today. Though our name probably has you thinking about economics particularly, these issues and life's biggest questions stretch beyond any single field and we think also necessitate the consideration of a moral framework. This year, Markets and Morality will be diving into the past, studying some liberty legends and the wisdom that they can offer to our view of free enterprise and human nature. For example, next month we will be hosting Dr. James Otteson from Wake Forest University, who will speak on his expertise of Adam Smith, the founder of modern economics. To get involved or just to stay in the know on all of our exciting events this school year, Talk to one of us sitting over here in the front and sign up for emails in the back after the lecture. You'll also find some good books, one of them written by our speaker tonight, and some cool stickers too. Tonight, it's my privilege to welcome one of our very own, Dr. Stephen Smith from the Economics Department. Dr. Smith received his Bachelor's of Economics from Williams College and his PhD in Economics from Stanford University. He is the Vice President of the Association of Christian Ec economists, and an expert in international trade and economic development. For all these reasons, we are grateful to have Dr. Smith here to speak on global flourishing and China's test of the West. As both a current and former student of Dr. Smith's, I know he has a lot of thought-provoking thought -provoking lecture in store for us, which will also be especially timely in light of ongoing tensions between the U.S. and China today. Please welcome Professor Smith. we doing on sound? Great. Not, not great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Ethan. How's that? More? Okay. I can hold it. I can hold it. Yeah. People, thanks for your patience. It is really great to be here tonight, and I thank you all for um, for your interest in this this topic. Big thanks to Markets and Morality for in inviting me, and and thank you, Anna Kate, for that kind. Uh, introduction. As you might imagine, uh, I've been following uh, developments in, in Hong Kong with great interest. It's been an amazing summer there, um, I'm fraught with, with uh, big issues. Uh, Hong Kong's fate is inextricably uh, bound up with China's situation, so in my repaired remarks here tonight, I'm going to focus in, uh, almost entirely on China. Uh, we'll have significant time for Q&A at the end of the talk, and I welcome your comments and questions, including at that time, if you're interested, uh, questions about Hong Kong. Forgive me. I'm going to need to turn around periodically to make sure that I'm in sync with my own uh, modest PowerPoint here. Okay. There we go. Okay. By way of introduction, I have to say, I, I take it for granted that in the long run, true global flourishing requires that China flourish too. But that's almost a truism. How could the world as a whole flourish if its single largest nation was not doing well? So the context for my remarks tonight is the current very challenging moment in relations between China and the West. We're at this moment in part because of China's rapid economic growth over the past 40 years. The scope and pace of that growth was unprecedented in human history and it resulted in a vast reduction in poverty and 
a vast improvement in material well-being in China. Growth was fast enough, in fact, and helped enough people to yield a measurable reduction in global income inequality, which was the first time that had happened in more than 500 years. China's market-oriented policy reforms in agriculture were the fuse that lit this rocket in 1978. Farmers were allowed to keep or sell any amount they produced over and above the quotas that they were required to sell to the state at the state's fixed price. Over the next three decades, further market-friendly policies came into play that would have been unimaginable in the brutal, centrally planned command economy of the Maoist era. Investment by foreign firms was allowed. Private ownership of firms was encouraged. The ban on education in the West was eased very substantially. The doors of the nation were opened and foreign visitors were welcomed as never before. And I might add, uh, those, uh, uh, the visitors that China has welcomed have included HOPE students, and I'm hopeful, despite the heavy things we need to talk about tonight, uh, that uh, another group of HOPE students will go to China in 2020 in, in May term uh, with, with me. All these policies I've just uh, mentioned were wise even though the move towards economic liberalization was never so thorough as to convert China into a, into a social market economy like Germany, uh, let alone a, a mixed market economy along the lines of the United States. The hand of the state remained dominant in economic life. But improved material well-being was a testimony to the power of trade and markets to promote prosperity. China's self-opening occurred at a propitious time, when it was matched by wise US and Western openness to trade. It's, it's somewhat fashionable now in the United States to critique our openness as if we would be better off if China was still poor, or that the United States has been a net loser in the exchanges of the past 40 years. This is ill-judged. A strategy of not engaging China would not have prevented its growth, would not have been tenable in the long run and would have engendered decades of, of ill will. Nonetheless, China is now at a difficult moment. And so therefore, we and the West in general are in a difficult uh, moment. So let me outline what I wish to say. I'll begin with a survey of China's current situation and I'll then consider China's political economy system, something I call a, a totalitarian statism system. Statism and totalitarianism create pathologies, pathologies that are now on full display in China. These, along with other more typical developing country problems, mean that China faces really important internal problems that will slow its growth possibly quite abruptly in the near future. And I conclude the talk by discussing what I mentioned in my, in my title. Uh, I'll discuss the challenges, the tests that China poses for the US and the West. Now, to be really clear, by the West, I mean all the countries around the world that have adopted and adapted the open access institutional software known as markets and democracy. The United States and Japan, Canada and Europe, South Korea and Australia, Taiwan and New Zealand, India and Chile. The challenges will test all of us uh, quite sorely. International relations theory uh, tells us that China is a rising new he uh, hegemon or, or a powerful leader uh, capable of reshaping the global order in ways that bolster its power, its wealth, and its influence at the expense of the West. This view is not necessarily wrong, uh, particularly in the very long run, but it's incomplete. I hope the challenges I identify will help us think really clearly about what is and what is not at stake. The way forward is complicated. I, I offer neither complete nor easy answers, uh, but I think it's possible to aim for a world in which a rich and flourishing China relates to an equally rich and flourishing West 
on terms much like the current relationship between the United States and Europe and Japan. The US-Europe relationship is contentious at times. It's competitive at times. The various countries involved in it employ somewhat different kinds of market systems and somewhat different kinds of democratic governance. But above all, their relationships are respectful, mutually beneficial, characterized by deep bonds of trade and investment and cultural exchange, within which each side benefits from the other's innovations. That should be the star we steer by in designing policy for Western relations with China. China's, China's burgeoning prosperity um, uh, since uh, 1978, the burgeoning uh, um, well-being of its, of its income since that time, it's, is manifest in, in thousands of ways. This is the old historic bell tower in, in Xi'an in, in, uh, northwest, in northwest China. It was one of the few such bell towers that wasn't destroyed in the Cultural Revolutions and in the Cultural Revolution. And now it's exciting to see part of the fruit of China's uh, renewed prosperity is the renovation and the restoration of the, of the bell tower in, in all, of its, all of its glory. It's a magnificent sight to see in, uh, in downtown uh, Xi'an. And I wanna think, uh, I wanna think hard about uh, China's current prosperity and what exactly uh, it means. Um, water parks, attractively designed urban promenades. So I'm su switching here to this topic. Um, water parks, river walks, comfortable apartments in cities and sturdy brick homes in rural areas, access to clean and efficient provisions of fresh food, groceries and household goods throughout the country. Substantially improved health care, radically greater availability of higher education, and on and on. All of this is the fruit of economic growth. This growth has not been without problems, and, and certainly uh, even severe problems. Uh, we could talk about that, but it would be fatuous to deny the overwhelming improvement in life on the ground experienced by the average Chinese person between uh, 1978 and today. And this, I, I like this picture because this is, it's, it's, a, it's a view of the, China, of the Chinese middle class now at play. Uh, this, is, this is a real thing. People are leading normal lives and it's, and it's wonderful. China's flourishing has helped the world, world flourish too. Southeast Asia and Africa have benefited from China's growing wealth. Again, not without, not without big problems. Uh, but uh, the United States also has benefited. It's startling to realize that Americans under the age of 40 have lived their entire lives in a world that's been characterized and benefited from a China growing reliably at 6 to 8% per year on average that entire time. We complain about our merchandise trade deficits with China uh, forgetting that China's purchases of our assets, particularly our federal government debt, has helped us tremendously. Chinese people are energetic and entrepreneurial. They exhibit enormous uh, friendship and conviviality. They prize and honor family relations, though a little differently than in the West. Uh, and they do this all in a language that is rich in nuance and puns and expressive capability. They are heirs to a truly great cultural tradition, including really astonishing uh, achievements in poetry, visual arts, and horticulture, and, and pottery. You, you do remember, we all eat off of China, don't you? Achievements as well, uh, uh, creative economic achievements in agriculture and architecture and technology. Uh, the Chinese, as any people do, truly deserve to flourish. 
And in their cities, we see some of the, some of the further fruit of this. Uh, the large building in the middle is the uh, famous uh, uh, and brand spanking new Shanghai Tower, which is China's tallest building. Uh, easy to spot there, I think. Forty years of growth have put China, though, in a paradoxical moment. Their average income of about $9,000 per person per year it is on par with Kazakhstan. It's 10% lower than Mexico's. Looked at that way, China is poor. It quite legitimately wants and needs to keep growing. Powering through from $9,000 per person per year to something like $20,000 per person per year which might take another 15 years of 5% growth on average per year. That would put it at the current level of Lithuania and Greece, about 15% behind Portugal. That is to say, China would still not be rich. At the same time, and this is, this is the paradox, in absolute terms, the size of the economy is already enormous. It's about two-thirds the size of the U.S. economy when measured in dollars. And when we measure it in terms of the actual purchasing power of the Chinese currency in China, it's 25% bigger than our economy. So individuals in China uh, can feel small and poor. But the community of nations now experiences China as large and powerful. This is an unavoidable structural reality, and it would be an important global tension even if China was a market-oriented, democratically governed society. Though it would probably be a lot easier to navigate that tension uh, than, our current, uh, than our current situation. So I need to think with you a bit about statism with Chinese characteristics. It is this particular set, uh, uh, it is this particular set of, uh, it, um, excuse me, to think about, to think about China's totalitarian statism, its particular economic and political system. It's important to recognize that China in fact has, um, um, Excuse me a second here. Yeah, I think I'm good. Uh, okay. A wide range of domestic challenges, a wide range of domestic policy choices to make. Um, its growth is slowing, and in 2019 might be uh, uh, quite uh, quite small. The official the official word is that it'll be six percent, but it's likely to be uh, actually maybe two or three percent a year even uh, this this year. China has exhausted the easy gains from infrastructure investment and low-tech manufactured exports. It now faces some severe demographic challenges as the generation born prior to the one-child policy uh, retires. And so the share of workers in the total population is on the cusp of falling really uh, dramatically. To get to $20,000 per year, China's productivity needs to more than double. That can only now come from innovation and skills-based technological improvements with increased uh, consumption rather than investment driving the domestic economy. The Chinese government acknowledges all of this. Uh, these are problems that it shares with other quote-unquote middle-income countries. But these kind of standard problems are not what's at the heart of China's current challenge to the West. That lies instead in China's political economy system of totalitarian statism. It was possible until about 10 years ago to think that a wealthier China would continue economic liberalization and begin uh, political liberalization. That has not happened. And the past decade has seen an important change in the character of China's system of politics and economics both of which point to a smaller role for the market and a turn back towards deeper political repression. This greatly complicates China's rise in the global system and perhaps uh, surprisingly also complicates and I think worsens China's own growth prospects.
So to consider the political first, China is not simply an authoritarian government, it's an increasingly totalitarian uh, government in ways that resemble, uh, sadly, the, uh, the, the Maoist era. The great firewall of China that separates most Chinese from news of the world is real. Uh, so a large portion of the country has little access to global news that might differ from the Chinese Communist Party's line. The brutal treatment of the Falun Gong, whose suppression began in 1999, was a harbinger of the brutal re-education camp treatment of Muslim Uyghurs in China's West. Freedom of religion for the many tens of millions of Christian believers has also been reduced in recent years. Uh, including restrictions on Christian education of, of young people. Xi Jinping is now uh, president for life. Uh, this was rubber stamped by the uh, National People's Congress uh, in, uh, in March uh, or of, of 2018 after the decision was made by the Communist Party Conference of October 2017. They ended term limits on the presidency that had been in place for more than two decades. Xi Jinping's political thought is now enshrined in the national constitution in the form of his treatise, quote, uh, this is the title, um, Xi Jinping Thought on Socialism with Chinese Characteristics for the New Era. Uh, I noticed you could buy English translations of this at the, uh, at the airports. Uh, uh, and um, um, my, my carry-on bag was already full, uh, but, maybe, but maybe next time. Um, the, the guts of his, the guts of his, of his thinking uh, uh, put the Chinese Communist Party squarely in command of all of the organs of state. Um, but we know that lifetime presidencies uh, tend not to end well. In this way, the Chinese Communist Party has reintroduced to China the bad emperor problem. There's little check from below on the party's authority nor is there any official system for leadership succession. Thousands of workers scrub the internet of any criticism of the Communist Party and keep track of the miscreants who dare to post such things. Surveillance with video and facial recognition software, tracking of bank and credit card transactions is widespread. The full, implementation, the full implementation of the social credit system, which is due to be completed in uh, 2020, the social credit scorekeeping system, I should say, that will increase the state's ability to monitor thought and behavior across the entire population. The vision of AI and technology-fueled totalitarianism coming into focus in China really should frighten all those who value human freedom and the inherent dignity of the person. But there's an economic side to this transition as well. The slowdown in economic liberalization uh, was perhaps less visible than the changes in the political side, uh, but very real. Uh, they began in the early 2000s uh, when the government of the time affirmed the dominant role of, uh, of state-owned banks and state-owned enterprises in the economy. Now we're deep into Xi Jinping's second term, and the Chinese government has doubled down on state-led rather than market-led economic strategies. State-owned firms are being consolidated into giant gargantuan firms uh, meant to be failure-proof national champions. Xi's uh, quote-unquote Made in China initiative aims by 2025 to grow 25 industries in which China is the global leader, fueled by state support including cheap capital, cheap land, lots of subsidies, and trade protection. Private property rights are weak at best. And so China is thus very much on the economic side, a statist economy, one in which private firms and markets are allowed to exist, but are dominated by state-owned firms and government control. And it's funny, at street level, m much of this control is, is invisible. Chinese cities offer a vibrant and colorful commercial color, uh, culture. And the Chinese themselves, of course, have a flair for entrepreneurship that drives commercial development when, when given its scope to operate. But a statist economy is definitely not a market economy, not even a kind of tightly regulated market economy. 
China's national and provincial governments direct how the economy runs by literally owning and running the key firms in most industries. Chinese central government owns the four largest banks and therefore controls access to bank loans. The state owns thousands of other firms across the economy, the largest steel firms, the main automakers, and their joint ventures with the US uh, and foreign automakers. Uh, it owns the biggest chemicals and insurance companies. It owns the airlines, oil and natural gas production, virtually all the telecommunications systems. Shanghai Tower that we saw a moment ago, that's, that is, um, that is government-owned. This type of economy, though, it, it stops short of the full command with central planning and the, and the, the old so Soviet-style uh, economy of pre-1978 China. Um, has enormous costs for the country. Bank lending goes overwhelmingly to state firms. Uh, state-owned state firms uh, take basically 70% of the total amount of credit that's available in the economy. And capital is wasted there on low, low value but politically well-connected projects. State planners' chronic inability to anticipate precisely where successful new firms and industries will emerge means that important investment opportunities are missed, while state planners' chronic slowness to close unprofitable firms, if ever, uh, means additional waste and losses. Tax and trade policies get distorted to help the state-owned enterprises or other favored firms, which harms the rest of the economy. Uh, the economist Derek Scissors at AEI uh, was the, uh, has provided some hel helpful recent estimates of the costs of these policies to the Chinese economy, and they're large. Um, the rate of return on assets of state-owned firms from 2008 onwards uh, has been less than half of that of private firms. Scissors notes that the private sector creates 80% of new jobs in China but gets 30% of the, of the capital. And he calls this a, a, a simply spectacular capital misallocation. And I would add uh, that it's something China really can't afford. The evidence on this is uh, overwhelming. The problem is, this isn't the worst of it. Statism marries political to economic power, and that's a feature of it, not a, not a bug. In China, Statism enables totalitarianism by offering party insiders and an elite unparalleled scope for patronage politics, rewarding allies and punishing opponents, consolidating power. It's not just that the police can apprehend and interrogate people at will, it's that any opposition can result in a job loss or the threat of a parent's job loss or loss of a residence permit and so on. This creates, an this creates an environment of extraordinary self-censorship. The prominent Princeton-based US-China specialist, Perry Link, described this aspect of Chinese totalitarianism uh, in, a, in a 2002 article. Uh, uh, things, things appear to have gotten worse now uh, in terms of the, the self-censorship that the system encourages. Hong Kong had a taste of this uh, just, two, just last month. The, the wonderful Hong Kong-based airline Cathay Pacific uh, was asked to remove from its flights flights that were going to overfly Chinese territory. Uh, all cabin and pilot crew who had participated in the Hong Kong demonstrations. This was meant as a direct reminder to the general public in Hong Kong that dissent has consequences, that if you want to do business with China, you, uh, you're, you're going to be pressured to play by China's, China's rules, and legal dissent, legally expressed on the streets in Hong Kong, will be held against people uh, in China. So the really the, the really grave matter, I think, here, uh, 
the, the, uh, among, among all the challenges that this, that this poses, um, I, I'd put it like this. Markets and a vibrant private sector are perfectly capable of marshalling a transition to a more innovation-based, productivity-enhanced growth for China if they're given breathing room and institutional support to do so. But the very reforms China needs now in order to foster another generation of growth require economic and political liberalization that would undermine the government's political control. This, I think, is the heart of China's current problem. The totalitarian system is now likely to want to inhibit growth rather than promote it, despite, despite itself. Economic and political freedoms will be further delayed, and there's a significant chance, actually, that China's growth will stall out at a low level for a long period of time. Because I think this is the heart of the matter, let me try to explain really clearly what I mean by saying that economic reforms threatens the party's control. Private firms to function need market-based access to credit from banks. It needs to be depoliticized, arm's length, business model based, actual profitability, expected profitability based lending to banks with no political interference. Instead, credit is allocated by by political, by political fiat, and the party does not want to give that up because it's a, a key way of rewarding allies and punishing enemies. The public and business firms need freedom of the press so that accurate financial and policy information is widely available to guide investment decisions. Instead, party-controlled news media cheerlead for the state's economic plans while Western reporters have their visas canceled for writing the truth about an Australian investigation just last month uh, into Xi Jinping's cousin's links to organized crime and money laundering. Firms need full recourse to impartial contract dispute settlement in the court system, full protection of intellectual property and other property rights under the rule of law. Instead, we get the closing of market-oriented civil society and rule of law promoting think tanks, such as uh, the UniRule think tank that was, uh, that was forced to shut down just a few weeks ago in Beijing. Firms and not-for-profit organizations need to be able to plan their own leadership and set their own leadership teams. Instead, party members are assigned to boards of directors, uh, uh, are required to be assigned to boards of directors. And the absence of habeas corpus protections means that business leaders, let, let alone the general public, business leaders are abducted by the state and held incommunicado without charge, introducing a wild element of uncertainty into all business activity. Wise investment and innovation require accurate economic data from truly independent statistical agencies. Instead, it can be hit or miss. So this is the pivot that the Chinese leadership, is, the party leadership, is not taking. Rather, it's making an, an, an all-chips-in bet that command and control is both, uh, in both economics and politics will sustain innovation and growth. In this, it is ignoring hard lessons the rest of the world has learned, and, and even hard lessons from China's own recent history. Uh, it's hard to innovate and invest and get it right every time. Government rarely has enough information or vision or independence from established interests to steer the economy better than private investors and innovators and actual owners would. We can identify particular projects particular industries that governments can direct and control and succeed at. Uh, some particular kinds of military innovations uh, come to mind. The project to create an atomic bomb, for instance, is a classic thing where command and control of the project via government can, can actually expedite it. But long term, for the whole economy, no way. At least, that's my prediction. 
and we can see in a few years how I'm, you know, how I'm doing on, on that. So now we're at the point where we can talk about China's tests of the West. All this, all this context under our, under our belts. Will totalitarian statism do better than democratic market systems? First and foremost, that's, this is actually a test for China, uh, but it's also a test for, for us and for the West. Uh, the prospect looms of a US and Europe and Japan and, and Australia uh, being deeply interdependent with an ideological adversary. If things go badly, there's a potential for a renewed Cold War in which two ideologically opposed trading blocs settle for a long face-off or worse. So it's time for clear thinking and a, and a long game. This means clear thinking about the US as much about, as about China. So, so here's the first test I want to propose. Can the US public come to understand what it means to live with another really large country in the world, not just us? This should not mean accommodating that other country in everything. But it does mean not assuming that global problems are adequately addressed once the US figures out its response to it. Let me take climate change as my example. Whatever one thinks about policies to address climate change, China is almost the whole game. They're the largest emitter by a factor of almost two. Their emissions are rising, our emissions are falling. They're like the snitch in, in Quidditch, in Harry Potter. You grab the snitch, you win the game. And I say that because uh, US efforts to curb emissions may have symbolic or strategic value, but the actual outcome for the environment will be settled by what China does or doesn't do. It's almost humorous to hear U.S. politicians discuss climate change and U.S. climate policy as if, as if U.S. policy is decisive. This, we're going to settle the issue here by, do, by doing this, never once mentioning China. I want to hear from them their plan for engaging China and getting significant greenhouse gas emissions from, uh, reductions from China, and then we can start talking seriously about their, their plans for the United States. So here's, a, so here's a second test for us. And this, this one is particularly for us as the United States. Uh, can the West, and particularly the US, learn to not blame China for problems that are not caused by China? I really can't overstate how important this is for clear thinking about, uh, about the current situation. Um, uh, a, a, classic, a classic issue here, uh, an example of this is the alleged decline in U.S. manufacturing and, and the problems of urban decay and job loss, in, uh, m much of which is, is occur has occurred in the, in the Midwest, um, which is attributed to China joining the World Trade Organization, uh, the WTO. Oh, my. Let's get to... Uh, Sarah's like, uh, Professor Estelle, thank you. Yeah, can we do that? Yeah. So this is so this is test two. We don't want to blame China for things that are problems that are not caused by by China. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah. Next slide, please. Yes. Yeah. So this is an important chart. This this is this is data that goes back to before um, World War II, and it simply shows the share of the U.S. workforce that works in manufacturing. And you can see that. Uh, you can see that in World War II here, there was an immense bulge in the U.S. workforce that was working in manufacturing to produce the munitions and, the, and uh, equip the armies and navies that, uh, that defeated uh, Nazism um, and, uh, and so on during, during World War II. And that, and that since then, there has been a, a, a very steady decline uh, in the manufacturing share of the U.S. workforce. Uh, starting, starting really in the mid-1950s. Now, 
China joins the China joins the World Trade Organization right right here in in, in 2001, right right there, right there. So it's just it just invites it. it it's it's not we're, we're not thinking clearly if we're saying oh, China did it. Well, I don't mean to suggest that that trade wasn't a part of of the decline in in employment in U.S. manufacturing, but so many other things played a role. The rapid growth of our pro productivity in manufacturing is amazing. You know, uh, U.S. manufacturing right now is currently producing, in real terms, more output than it ever has at any period. Uh, so in output terms, we're doing amazingly well. Um, it, we're just, um, you know, we're, we're, we're so productive that we're not hiring that many workers in manufacturing uh, any, anymore. Um, but here's, a, but here's a, a further hard truth from, uh, from economics in the spirit, and I offer this to you in the spirit of clear thinking. The U.S. needs to come to grips with the fact that to the extent that trade with China, in fact, may have harmed some cities and towns in the United States, protectionist trade policy will not bring those jobs back. It won't. Far, far better is to assist affected communities in other ways. In fact, flat out subsidizing them, giving people cash to pay for moving to a new job, paying for education, paying for infrastructure in those, in those communities. Flat out subsidizing them will be more effective and less costly for the rest of the economy than anything we can do with respect to trade policy. Thank you. <laughs> Test three. Can the U.S. bestir itself to marshal the existing global governance architecture to encourage China's government towards political and economic reform? I think we can, but this takes patience, statecraft, and an ability to work with allies across the board. Do we have that kind of sustained resolve? Our, our aim here shouldn't be containment, but engagement, active engagement that collaborates with possible, where possible with China, but wrestles for change in, in many places using the openings provided by current international treaties and multilateral organizations and by US and Chinese law. So for instance, the much derided WTO and other global multilateral institutions uh, can be quite useful for challenging the Chinese government's totalitarianism while continuing to include it in global institutions. Current WTO rules allow nations, such as us, to ban imports of products made by prison labor. We'd have to do this carefully uh, with evidence made public, but that right should definitely be exercised. Chinese firms that steal intellectual property can be sued under US law, under Chinese law, and under WTO rules. Rather than putting tariffs on all imports from China, which harm innocent firms in China, which harm US firms in China, and of course harm the United States it, itself. China can be challenged to live up to its specific WTO obligations uh, to not subsidize firms. Obligations it signed in, a tr in, in treaty form in the early 2000s, uh, but which have not been, have not been enforced. Um, I think of this as kind of what I would call the International Justice Ministry's approach to building respect for rule of law and, uh, in, in China. Insisting that countries live up to their own laws, and in this case, their treaty obligations, rather than uh, from the beginning, from the outset, as a first move, bullying them or dictating, them, uh, or dictating to, to them. Above all, none of this should be done alone. The U.S. needs patiently to build coalitions of the willing to fight these fights. Thank you. It's crucial that we distinguish always between the Chinese state, that is, the party, uh, and the Chinese people. The Chinese Communist Party works very hard to identify itself almost entirely as the, 
uh, as the sole and true protector of Chinese national honor and true patriotism, and to portray any criticism of the party beyond the criticism that it specifically allows um, as disloyalty to the country. The West must work very hard to always lean into this distinction between party and nation. Thank you. Number five, can the democratic capitalist economies of the West resist at home the state-led model for economic life that China now espouses around the world? Do we have the courage of our convictions about the merits of free speech, free enterprise, and equality of opportunity and democratic governance? I would argue that nothing less than a democratic market system befits the inherent dignity of the Chinese people. We should settle for no less ourselves. Christians in particular can have a clear conscience in advocating for this in the United States and for China. Let me be clear, this is not about arguing that markets and democracy are perfect. It's not about pushing China to be exactly like the US, which it will never be, nor, nor should it be. Nor is it about imposing change on China nor is it about excluding China from the rulemaking of the international community that its size really, in, in, some, in, in, in a fundamental sense, entitle it to. Rather, it's about the fact that democratic market systems offer the most practical and robust ways to jointly protect civil freedoms and economic well-being. We humans flourish best when we live in families and community with one another in ways that allow us to give full expression in our character and our actions to the imago dei, the image of God within us. This requires institutions that allow considerable personal freedom, freedom of association, speech, and, and press, and that enforce the property rights necessary for exercising creativity, stewardship, and civic responsibility with real personal agency. This also requires a state that administers uh, and a rule of law that embodies justice, including a significant social safety net. Democratic capitalism offers a broad avenue towards flourishing along which practical wisdom and Christian theological insight can walk hand in hand. So I encourage you to work in ways large and small towards a future in which Chinese citizens are free to speak and to associate and which and in which the Chinese state is accountable to genuine democratic governance. Democratic capitalism with Chinese characteristics would look different than that in the United States in many ways, uh, probably along the ways that democratic capitalism, democratic market systems uh, in Japan and Korea are different from those in the United States. But they would be recognizably of a kind, shared prosperity, trade, thick ties of social and economic intercourse would mark a flourishing US-China relationship, just as they do in our current relationship with Europe and Japan and Korea. The world and the United States will be the better, uh, the better we rise to these tests. I hope I've said enough provocative things now for us to uh, have some great questions. Thank you for your time tonight. Thank you, Professor Smith, especially with all the technical difficulties. Um, for Q&A, can we ask the audience for when you ask a question to speak up because we won't have a mic going around. And then perhaps Professor Smith, if you could repeat the core of the oh, question okay. Good idea. Um, for everyone to hear. Um, I'll help and keep an eye out for questions and we can all just field them. So we'd like to take any student questions first. And if not, then community members. Fire away.
So that's a great question, and it's really it's several parts to it. Um, given that the, at least one of the initial demands of the protesters has now been met, um, and, and more demands are on the table now, um, is it possible that the Hong Kong demonstrations could be part of a driving force for a permanent change in China? Is that a fair uh, summary of it? Right. Um, oh my, this is, this is a really fraught and complicated situation, and I, I can think aloud with you about it, but I would be foolish to make any specific predictions. Uh, the, the Chinese, the, the, the fact that you, you had almost a quarter of, of Hong Kong's population in the streets over the course of, uh, multiple times over the course of a month, um, would in a normal society, would have caused that proposed law to be uh, pulled back uh, immediately, permanently pulled back. And, and the, the, the protesters have, have achieved a surprising victory in accomplishing that and tenaciously continuing to demand that. Um, they, um, they are mostly young people. Uh, and, and, you know, if you look at opinion polls, uh, it's mostly older people who don't want to challenge China, who don't want to poke the beast, who are, are perhaps, you know, who I know have living memory of what it was like to live under communism directly and are concerned about the kind of payback uh, that the Communist Party is capable of, of marshalling. But uh, the, the young people in Hong Kong and their idealism um, um, have have really shown that that economic well-being and they are well off economically is not enough. You need dignity. You need the dignity of being able to vote for your own leader, and not simply um, have a partial public vote uh, uh, across a slate of candidates that that Beijing has selected. Um, Now, where, where it goes from here is, is anybody's guess. The continued demands of the protesters are, are, are legitimate in any normal use of that, uh, that word about d democratic governance. Uh, they, want, uh, they want universal suffrage election of the, of the, um, of the governor of Hong Kong. Um, they want um, an investigation into the police, police uh, use of force um, uh, during the protests. They want, they want charges removed that claim that the, that the protests were riots as opposed to simply legitimate uh, peaceful uh, protests. Um, um, this is, if, I, I have to say, if the protests continue, uh, the, there, there, will be, there will be, at some point, pushback and a firm reaction from China. I, I, the, the, the current regime has essentially no, no wiggle room. It, it, there are no spaces in China that are safe for dissent. And to allow that in Hong Kong and say you, can, you really can do in Hong Kong something important that you can't ever do in China um, opens a door, a tiny crack to the idea of, of liberalization. A political liberalization, and I think I think the I think the the current government of China will resist that uh, intensely, 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 and I, and it reflects it reflects their their lack of confidence in in their own legitimacy. Um, now, how, so how this ends, I don't know. That's so. Those are some some thoughts about it. I should say, um, uh, this, is, um, uh, this is a picture of Hong Kong. It's uh, looking at the Kowloon uh, side of the harbor from, the, from the, the peak, Victoria Peak, across Central, then across the harbor uh, to the Kowloon side. And if you look closely, kind of halfway up the Kowloon side in the middle, that's my house where I grew up. They've painted it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
So the last 30 years, China has grown really fast. You're proposing that for China 40 to... 40 years. 40 years? For China to continue to grow quickly, it needs to give up on the status totalitarianism. Probably. Um, let's, let's say we wanted to try to convince China. How do we do that when, for the last 40 years, they've outperformed so many countries that have liberalized? As usual, an, another great question uh, from uh, Professor McMullen. Um, um, you know, some people are saying we, we, need, to, we, we need to provide the Chinese leadership a kind, a, an exit strategy. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that will work. It's like they're riding a tiger right right now, but um, to uh, they're they're aware that they're making a bet. Um, the the large countries, the large developing countries that have tried to use statist economic policies to to push growth beyond simply getting to where China is now, uh, Brazil. Mexico, um, Argentina, um, the, the statism has not worked well for, for them. Statism has, has led to massive waste of, of resources, um, growing, growing poverty, um, and, and really, uh, really weak economic performance. And so um, Brazil, Mexico are countries that are sometimes pointed to as having gotten stuck in, in, in that, in that, um, in that a middle income, middle income trap. The Chinese are betting that, with really strict top-down control on their on their investments and careful planning from a technocratic elite, that that the um, um, uh, and um, all all carefully all carefully calibrated with um, the the use of of, techno of, of new technology. Uh, that they'll be able to beat beat those odds and and make it and make it work. I don't I don't think they're going to be able to do that, uh, but they seem super confident that they that they will. And in truth, in truth, they may succeed at it for five years, for ten years, for fifteen years. I don't know. They may succeed at it for a while. But what I think Hong Kong shows, and what I think Taiwan shows, and what I think. Um, South Korea shows, um, Korea and Taiwan having made uh, transitions to democratic governance away from authoritarian governments uh, as, as their economies grew, is that economic performance is never enough. People rightly want something more. And there will, I'm confident, there will be a day of reckoning. Uh, and, and Hong Kong's giving us a, a hint of it. Right, and and uh, that is, uh, you, you are speaking the truth. You are speaking the truth. Uh, China, uh, many, uh, you know, a large share of the Chinese population does indeed uh, continue to revere uh, revere Mao. And and you know, if if you had a vote on on aspects of the performance of the Communist Party in leading China over the last forty years, they they do they do well on a lot of things. Um, which, which incidentally continues to puzzle me about why they, why they haven't been willing to have to have some votes and put a shred of, of democratic legitimacy around around their around their actions. Um, um, I, so I think I think at bottom, I think it's I think it's this: the the generation that grew up in poverty. Is now, 
is now, it's too soon to say that they're moving from the scene, but they're now getting, getting up in years. Um, the the, the young, young people, people born after 78, uh, particularly in the rich coastal cities, uh, assume prosperity. They, as, they assume ever-rising standard of, of living. They're proud of China for having some, in their eyes, amazing technological accomplishments. The, the high-speed rail system that they've built is a, is a marvel, and people are legitimately proud of that. Um, but, but it's widely acknowledged that there's a kind of emptiness in Chinese um, uh, urban material society with faith pushed, literally pushed to the, to the side and traditional Chinese religion not actually offering, offering something that stirs the soul. Um, and there's, there's angst. I, I, so I, I, do, I, do think, I do think there's a potential for, for, a, for a renewed interest in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in reform, political reform. And I might add, I might add, um, the, 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 the think tanks, the, the professors that have now been silenced in the last five years give some evidence that, there's a, that there is in fact a, a, a native, Chinese, authentically Chinese demand for democracy with Chinese characteristics. So I, 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 I guess I, 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 I'm, a, so I'm less pessimistic about, about that. I think a, a more incremental approach uh, would be would be really wise. I'd, I'd start with some things that are, might seem small but have symbolic value and would grow in importance over time. I'd pick I'd pick one intellectual property fight to fight. I'd pick one one services export from the U.S. fight to fight, and I would array allies ar around my my position and I would negotiate hard hard for that. Um, and I'd and I'd and I'd use particular kinds of, of threats, not blunderbuss threats that we'd stop. You know, we'd put tariffs on all Chinese exports to the United States, but but pick out pick out particular countries. Uh, excuse me, particular firms that that China was uh, most interested in promoting, and 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 target target them. Um, to be clear. There is a genuine intellectual property problem in, in China. Uh, there, there is theft of U.S. intellectual property in, in, in China uh, that, that has to be dealt with. There are significant restrictions on, on services uh, that we can sell into the Chinese market. Uh, that's a problem. We, uh, they have a lot of access to our market. We, in, in fairness, we need more access to their market. Uh, um, uh, my favorite example of this is, is that China restricts uh, the number of U.S. films that can be distributed in China each year to, to, to 39, a total of 39 uh, films. They get to pick which ones. And, and you know, if there was not a restriction there, we, we'd be able to distribute at least 100 films, I think, you know, way, way more. We're, we're, you know, Hollywood is the world's, uh, you know, it's got the comparative advantage. It's the world's most efficient producer of, of, uh, of films, good and bad. And, um, and, uh, that would be, you know, China. China has, China has signed treaties that, in which it is uh, has obligated itself to open its service market to to U.S. exports. Um, we need to really make that make that case, and and work on them. Um, if they if they resist, then under WTO rule WTO rules. Uh, the, under the trading rules of the current system that, that our president is, is so quick to criticize, we, we can then be authorized to, to um, uh, attach punitive uh, tariffs on Chinese Im imports. Um, we, need, we need just much more careful policy here, much more thoughtful policy. 
Um, and if and 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 if you want an example of that, you know the this this is a this a terrible uh, example, but I mean, a, but a great and revealing example. The Chinese firm ZTE uh, was on the cusp of being convicted of a number of, of violations of U.S. law, and the Trump Justice Department had had them. Um, uh, and that that's the perfect way to deal with Chinese firms violating U.S. law is to charge them under U.S. law uh, in U.S. courts, hold them accountable. Sanctions were about to be imposed on the firm. Xi Jinping and Trump talked, and Trump tweeted the next day, oh, I had a great chat with Xi Jinping. You know, I'm not going to, we're not going to do the sanctions on ZTE. You know, Xi's a good guy, and he said it was going to hurt, hurt the firm, and, you know, it's like, what? Um, uh, we, we, need, we need a steady, thoughtful uh, hand in, in crafting our relationship with China. There was another word. Yeah. So this is hard. I I think I think you 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 I think you need to do a variety of things. I, I think it's time for really reviving Voice of America, and and uh, channeling straight into into China as much as possible. Um, uh, you know, it, it wouldn't have to be U.S. produced news. It could just simply CBS uh, would 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 actually be a, a big improvement over um, uh, the People's Daily. And um, I think, I think since, since, since a, a specific intervention in China is off the, is off the table, um, I think it needs to be about e equipping uh, Chinese intellectuals, equipping, um, um, and equipping Chinese intellectuals and, and holding specific Chinese firms and specific, and, and specific actions of the government to account through current legal, uh, legal systems, which is, which is a road we just simply haven't walked down yet. Uh, I, I, I do think that that could, to, to have that reported in China, um, or, or to spread that word in China, would, would really say a lot about US values and would send the signal that the U.S. was firm about dealing with violations, but was not trying to push all of China out of the global system, and was not saying that legitimate Chinese concerns would not be considered. I, I, I think that's the way to. I think that's the way to go. I'm not, and I'm not sure there's another way. Can you speak up? Sorry. Thanks. So the question is, how should the U.S. treat Chinese students in the United States, and or in terms of how many visas it would allow, and uh, the terms under which they were allowed into the country? These are all great questions, just great. So, so you know, um, I'm basically in favor of 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 having as many Chinese students in here as are, are able uh, as are able to to pay. Um, the uh, um, but it, but it, it, it gives and it, it gives and it takes. I mean, I think I think Chinese students are impressed with the U.S. in, in many ways. The high level of social trust, the, um, uh, the the very generalized prosperity. It's not for all of our concerns about income inequality. Uh, prosperity ac across rural areas and urban areas is is quite 
quite evenly, quite evenly spread compared, compared to in China, where it's more like a cliff from the rich coastal areas into the po much radically poorer uh, countryside. Um, there's, much, there's much that Chinese students uh, enjoy and come to like about the United States. There's, there's much about US culture that they find off-putting. Uh, um, maybe this isn't true for West Michigan, but, but in much of the world, uh, in much of the US, Chinese students find that US students' concern for family is shockingly low. Um, and, and that uh, we're, we're not uh, tied in res appropriately, respectfully to our, to our family network uh, the way, uh, uh, the way a, a, a properly raised Chinese young person would, would be. Um, um, I think learning about all of that is, is very much to the good. I think we do need to be careful about where Chinese students study, studying technology, uh, where they work, where their internships are. And I think it's perfectly reasonable for the United States to put, uh, put national security restrictions on the kinds of labs that they can work at, and the kinds of things they can send out of the country or take with them when they, when they leave. Perfectly reasonable to have restrictions on the firms they work with um, uh, for their internships. Um, national security uh, is, is, is important, and uh, I think on the tech side, I think, I, think, uh, um, some, I think we could easily devise some sensible restrictions there. So some immediate thoughts. Thank Professor Smith again one more time. Thanks.